Hey guys, welcome to another video. We've been in the middle of a really bad heat wave here in the middle of fe pe February, which is really unusual. It's like hitting, hitting the high 80s today and it's just been getting hotter and hotter. Big fire <laughs> within about a half hour of my home. Luckily it didn't affect us at all. But So I've been just working on coloring and kind of really wanting to go to the beach and really wanting to go in the outdoors and really envy all the people that can go out there and enjoy themselves right now. But we have family members that have high at-risk conditions, so we're still sheltering place while we kind of get through this end of the Omicron surge in our area. And um, I was watching uh, Coloring um, with Claire, and she recommended this this coloring book. And I really, really, really wanted to learn how to do fur and animals, and it, it seemed like there was a lot of fur um, opportunities to learn how to do fur on a wide variety of animals. And so I got out my museum aquarelle, and I used all the colors that I thought uh, really looked good uh, that would match my, my bunny, Brownie, who we lost last year. And my goal is to uh, take pastel classes and um, learn how to really transfer a photograph onto artist grade paper and watercolor him and or do his portrait in pastels and color pencils everything um, I find that watercoloring is harder to learn and there's a steeper learning curve but with pencils there's a little bit more control and so I kind of see these coloring books as sort of coloring on training wheels <laughs> because the illustration is there um, and you can watch all the videos on YouTube these pastelists out there are just unbelievably phenomenal a lot of them that specialize in pet portraiture who I've been following lately that I'll put links to below um, just taking a deep dive into all their free videos um, really taught me a lot about fur and while I kind of grasp it theoretically and conceptually putting it into, into practice is very different but still, uh, with a grayscale coloring book, it's, again, sort of like gives you the ability to uh, sort of be on training wheels um, without all that pressure to just go solo with a blank sheet of paper. So I've done all of this with the Museum Aquarelles, and I just thought I would show you what it looks like before I apply the color. Um, and then I'll show you one that I did last night. Um, and sorry, I don't have a lot of uh, room for maneuvering here. So this little mouse is so adorable. He's not done. And normally I don't really f uh, find myself attracted to mice, but <laughs> he was illustrated in such a cute way. And so everything that I learned from those videos, I just applied, um, assuming that this animal has short, fine hair and I colored him in the colors of brownie and then I was at the Liberty of London website because I also absolutely love fabric especially if it looks illustrated and painted by a professional artist and there was this adorable print that had all of these colors with a very similar floral arrangement so I sort of used that as my color inspiration so I really I really love the way this came out and um, so uh, I did it as a test uh, before I applied water to the other one that I just showed you because I wanted to see how to use the water brush to get this this to spread around. It's, it's a little tricky. And um, so I thought I would share my results. And I'm a little bummed that the grayscale um, in this coloring book isn't traditional grayscale. Um, in some areas, it does look like traditional grayscale. In other areas, it just kind of looks like the artist was trying to use grayscale, but to create texture, and the ink is just really heavy. And so, for example, in this area, it's so heavy, and that's why this area of the body just looks like a big block of color. It was so darkened in with dark, heavy lines that there was no way to really color that in a way that made me feel satisfied. Um, and so this book is highly rated on Amazon. Uh, people love it. I'm, I just am looking 
to it for different purposes. I'm grateful there's a book out there with animals that I can practice with. It's hard to find a good coloring book, and the paper is, is decent. Uh, so uh, I did the first picture that I did, I did with the Museum Aquarelles, uh, sorry, sorry, the Neo Color 2 pastels from Crondash. And um, this was the sea otter, and it's, I never uh, finished it. I don't know if I ever will finish it, but um, I just wanted to share this because I wanted to prove the point that this paper in this book, it was able to accept at least four layers of color and wash. But by the time, so I really wanted to darken up this area. And at that point I was getting to my fifth and sixth layer and I was basically running out of tooth and uh, the color was washing away and it just didn't want to grab to the colors underneath. And so this area is really washed out and muted because I'm just was running out of tooth in the paper. Here it's still really rich. And so that's why uh, I was saying in my earlier video, when you're using these uh, Crown Dash products like the Neo Color 2 or the Museum Aquarelles, um, I find you get the best results when you layer on as many layers as you can if you're using a coloring book so that uh, because it can only handle t like two or three washes of very light water. And I learned that from another person on YouTube. It wasn't something I taught myself, but it definitely helped me progress in using these products. The other thing I realized is with an intricately drawn illustration like this, that the Neocolor 2s uh, just applying directly from crayon to paper didn't give me the control that I was looking for because I would have preferred to have gotten something like a pencil tip to go into these fine areas. And also, when I looked at the visual reference for sea otters, they basically have blonde hair, and I was just trying to simulate that with yellow tones. And, and there is a white crayon, but uh, I think you'd have to go in here with some white gouache or something. Well, tinted white, like maybe start with white gouache as a tint and add, a, sorry, my camera. Um, and uh, you'd have to treat it more as mixed media and get really clever with figuring out how to uh, get the true colors that you want if you don't have the colors that you're looking for. Um, and I could see here um, that I used a very bright blue and so I only needed two layers of color here. And if I had started out with that bright blue from the get-go, uh, you know, I might not have had to have worried about darkening this area here. So if you're looking for areas where you want your darkest tones, really play that up a lot so you don't have to go back in. I was trying to layer with a lighter color than a mid-tone and a dark color. And what I learned is that you really need to play up your darkest tones a lot with this, pro this Neo Color 2. Uh, and again, I didn't really feel like I had the control that I was looking for. Like, I should have switched to pastel with the seaweed because those Neo Color 2 pastels have such wide tips. It was hard to keep it inside the lines with art that gets real small like that. But also, I, I don't mean to say anything rude about the artist, but this is not what the head of a sea otter looks like at all. Um, I, I Google searched images, and every single one of them have a very brown face. And I guess we could assume his head is wet. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, that could be technically, you know, accurate. But I just would have preferred, I, I live in California. I've been to the Marine Institute in Monterey where they have these adorable sea otters. It's just enough to break your heart. They're so precious. I'm looking at them right now on my computer. And um, so what I just found a sea otter photo that I really loved and then I used that for picking out all my colors and figuring out how to build out that sea urchin and stuff like that but after doing this you know I was just thinking I think I would be much happier just tracing a sea otter photo directly I have a glass monitor like an oversized glass monitor for my son that he no longer needs or wants so we've set it up on, on in my room on an articulating arm and I'm just planning on using it like a light box to just trace photos from and just really get into painting from photos. 
But I do think that when you're not feeling well or you're tired or you're exhausted, you know, and you just don't want to use expensive art supplies, but you do want to practice, this is a great way to practice and make a bunch of mistakes and learn a lot uh, with inexpensive supplies. And uh, I've been working with this book for so long now that I, I can see the illustration in my mind without even seeing the book. It's just kind of burnished in my, in my brain. <laughs> so I've, yeah, I've been doing, um, I've been trying to keep myself distracted this week because I've been just feeling very, like a lot of pandemic fatigue, a lot of cabin fever. And, uh, you know, I want uh, my, the people in my family that are super high at risk, there's no way I'm going to go outside right now. I'm waiting for the positivity rate to get below 4%, which is considered a rate at which the pandemic is in control. And we were at 30% positivity two weeks ago. So yeah. Uh, anyways, it's, it's getting better, but we're not quite there yet. Um, so this I'm really embarrassed to show, but I'm, I'm just going to show it anyways. I, uh, I don't really like the aggression of this illustration, but um, there's a gal in Norway that just moved uh, into a farm in northern Norway who does videos in English, and I've been following her for the past year in the pandemic because I can kind of experience some, uh, you know, international travel vicariously when I get really tired at night. And they just had this incredible uh, scene of the Aurora, Aurora Borealis. So it, find, it made me realize, oh, I think these lines are supposed to be for the Aurora Borealis. So I was trying to capture it, and it just looks like a hot mess. <laughs> I think I pressed down too hard on the, these are the Neo Color 2 pastels. Um, so what I did for color reference is I just looked for an iceberg on YouTube. And I just Google, Im, Im, I just used the image search feature on Google. And I found an iceberg that had a very light uh, pastel aqua color up here that I didn't quite capture. And then the water was just very deep blue. And then the iceberg underneath was in all these beautiful dark blue tones. And then this side of the iceberg was very aqua. It was just stunning. So I think I did a better job over here and as compared to over here. There's a smaller range of aquas and there's a bigger range of blues. And then with the uh, polar bear, um, they're sort of like the sea otters. They, they're they white with a lot of yellow uh, in, in certain areas of their body. And I just didn't have the color range to capture that. So um, I'm just uh, using the grayscale um, sketch marks as my uh, guidelines for where to put the darkest tones and while it kind of came out okay here it looks like I've kind of done all the color mapping but the blending hasn't been completed it's just too blocked out and not blended enough and I don't think I'm going to get any more results from the watercolor because the tooth is just going to dry out and that's what happened here I wanted so I put down a lot of heavy color here on this one but not enough here before I laid down the water. And every time I went back in to add more water, it just didn't want to take any more water and the pigment just kept getting more faded and more faded. So um, the way to fix him, I think, is to use an oil-based pencil and just think of your watercoloring as the underpainting. And I've learned this on YouTube, so if you're watching this video, I'm sure you already know that, but I'm just uh, gonna let you know why, what my theory on why he needs some help and how he demonstrates the importance of laying down as much color as possible. In traditional uh, watercolor painting, you just do a very light wash of all of your tones, light, dark, and medium, and then you go back in and reapply all those tones and you do your blending and you keep reassessing and reassessing until hopefully something very three-dimensional emerges and if you're going for realism that it looks very real. And, um, but, uh, you know, this is kind of like a fantasy thing, uh, from the illustrator and I'm, I'm just practicing and what I'm learning is that, uh, you can't really check and recheck your, all of your tones because, especially if you're working with coloring books, because 
the paper just can't handle it. So I think this is kind of just making me really want to stop doing coloring books and just go into actually going into real photos. I'm finding that I'm enjoying looking at the photos and trying to recreate the photos more than I am working from an artist's interpretation of the subject and then being forced to use the areas that they think that the different tonal range should go. So, but it's a, just something really cool to do when you just don't really have any mojo, which I haven't had a lot of uh, lately. So um, I'm gonna go back to the fox that I took you to in the beginning. Um, because there's, as far as I could tell, there was only one YouTube video that demonstrated this. And so, I, of course, I, I am not an art teacher. I have not been trained in art. I'm teaching myself. But I, I wanted to use, I wanted to be able to look back on my life in the future and say that I used this time wisely to do something that I might not otherwise have done. And to be able to say, you know what, there was a silver lining and that something really cool came out of this. And uh, working on this just gave me the patience that I might not otherwise have had because my temptation is to want to go outside and put my feet in the water and get some sunshine and go get some ice cream and an iced coffee and watch the sun and look at the water and just find some inner peace and... Right now, that's really not an option, so um, I'm just uh, trying to do the next best thing. Um, so, super huge bummer, our air conditioning were, uh, broke um, last summer, so we're kind of working off of fans right now, um, not really wanting uh, appliance repair people in the house. So, um, I had two choices. Uh, I've tried coloring this in in two different ways in previous projects. In one way, I took the um, my fattest brush and then I just tried to drag it down, you know, from each section of the fur using the side of the brush. Because when you use the tip of the brush, these bristles are very stiff in these water brush pens and it tends to move the color around. And then you lose all of that shading that you've so carefully built up with this short fur. And you could end up just moving everything around and just, you will lose what you created when you started out, especially with a paper that has hardly any tooth. You know, this isn't watercolor paper. So I tried something different last night. I took my Derwent number one brush with the mouse that you saw earlier. It has a really tiny little tip and I just squeeze out a little bit of water. And then what I did was I just tried to uh, do each section of the fur. And so I'm gonna start out, why don't I start out? So I'm having to do this with the camera in front of me. So it's, and I have tin, literally have tin foil on my window. It's so gosh darn hot. hot. <laughs> it's kind of easier to help keep the, uh, the heat down. So I, I'm just going to show you, I, I just, I have the number one brush. It helps when you're dealing with all of these different sections of the fur that have all of this jaggedy edge. And as you can see, I'm just using the side of the brush, not the tip of the brush. And now you can see that this very fine brush gives you a lot of control section by section and using the side rather than the tip just wettens the water. It wettens the pigment without moving it around. And to me that's the best way to get the color to stay in place where you want it. And uh, then you can kind of let that section dry and then you can go back in and do the inner ear because that's a different color and you don't necessarily want them to mix or you if you want them to blend, then you can just kind of wet the inner ear real quick. And then what I can do is that flicking motion where I can just, for blending, is just flick some of that darker color 
into the lighter color for blending. And this is where that grayscale, the type of grayscale this artist used just drive me a little crazy because there's just so much thick heavy line that it just prevents me from laying down anything. It's just kind of not, my color isn't able to show up on top of that thick heavy line. So um, if I want to do the eyes now for example, then I, I took animation classes on and off for two, like about a year. I was looking at them very intensively, I want to say, for about two or three months. And I think I, I did about seven tutorials, and I redid half of those a couple of times. And that's the extent of my background in watercolor. <laughs> so, anyways, um, uh, I'm, I'm just using the, the tip of the pen to go over the strokes the stroke marks that were laid down by the illustrator in this grayscale and I'm just this is allowing me to gently apply the water to activate um, the pigment so it can fill in the uh, the paper and this is where you have to be a little careful because this uh, watercolor is going to move around a lot and it's very difficult to be more in control of it because if you're coming from traditional watercolor you're used to laying down one layer of color and letting it dry but in this case you're laying down all of your tones all in one layer and then you're activating it with one light wash of color um, because you're, you're dealing with paper that was not really designed for water. And so now you can see the difference between the side that was, you know, this is activated with water and this isn't. And I almost thought, oh my god, I'm just going to leave it colored because <laughs> what happens if the water ruins it and all that work for nothing, but I just have to remind myself this is for practice and if I ruin it then that just means I'll know what not to do the next time. But I ruined a, I ruined a bunch of things already and that helped me realize you know how to how to do this and make these pencils work a little better. So I just kind of very the use of my brush so that I'm just mostly using the side of the brush but then using the tip of the brush when that makes sense. So whenever there's a lot of areas where a flicking motion was required to fill in the coloring then you, you can use the flicking motion of the brush with the tip. Otherwise I just try to use the side of the pen. Um, so you can see this ear has a lot of jaggedy edges. Um, and by the way, I got criticized in a watercolor class at Animes and one of the students told me <laughs> on my first assignment, there was a cute little Easter chick and he said, don't stay inside the lines. It's not meant to be that you stay inside the lines. It looks like a cartoon. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Thanks for telling me that. My first attempt at watercolor is not what I want to hear right now. Um, so, uh, anyways, um, that is a drawback to working with a heavy-handed illustration because in real watercolor, you would uh, somebody would draw out the illustration, and then I've seen some professional artists take an eraser and uh, the kind that um, you can roll up into like a little ball and just use it like a snake and roll over the pencil. Billy Shawl does that and uh, you'll, you can eliminate half of the pencil so it never shows up. And then I just saw a botanical watercolor illustrator artist, an amazing woman, I'll put a link to below, where she uses a heavy, heavy application of graphite pencil and that's she puts so many layers of paint in that it just, it never shows in her final 
drawing. So um, I just saw a video last night from a new, a new artist that I hadn't seen before. And she said, these are the things I wish I knew before I got started. And I felt like I had learned all of those lessons, you know, and I was just thinking, I wonder if these videos on I wish I knew are actually helpful to people because sometimes I think the lessons that you learn may not necessarily mean anything to someone until they've actually made the mistake and then realize, oh yeah, I went through that same learning curve. So I don't know. Um, I think ultimately from taking online art lessons and watching so many YouTube videos, one thing that I have learned is that the best way to learn is to just look at what other people are doing, but don't just follow one artist, follow many different artists. And you, you, you kind of have to find your way based on your own starting point, your own interests, what you gravitate to, what works for you. There was a, well, there is an incredibly famous uh, quilter, and that was uh, something I used to do a lot a long time ago. Um, in terms of crafts, quilting was the first thing that I did, and then I kind of got into knitting. And there was this, there was a girl called Karen McTavish, and uh, she was doing long arm quilting in a little artist loft. And she just was trying to do this for a living. And sorry, I have a hard time with this book because the spine doesn't want to lay flat and the page isn't perforated, so I can't take it out of the book. It makes it a real challenge to move the paper around. So um, she's living in this uh, studio slash art, uh, this art studio slash living uh, place. And she's gone into business for herself and doing long arm quilting. And she just couldn't figure it out. She just couldn't get the hang of it. And so she just invented her own style. And her own style became so famous that other people started imitating her. And I always remember her because um, I feel like if I'm ever going to get better at art, I'm, I'm going to get better because I'm not imitating somebody. I'm just finding my own way uh, as I make mistakes and I, and I keep learning. Sorry, I don't have any music. I, I learned the hard way and this makes me really appreciate all the YouTubers out there that put these amazing music tracks on their video. It, it doubles the processing time for rendering a video, and uh, it, it and on my computer, which is like getting a little outdated, it uh, it takes about an hour to just render the video compared to like ten minutes. So I'll just uh, stop and kind of show you. Um, I kind of I can hold up the light. Um, and now you can kind of see this whole area has been wet and I've wet that area here, all of here and here. And then I'll go back and finish it on my own because it'll be easier to do with, with the, out the camera in the way. But um, I just wanted to kind of show you the difference between what it looks like with all the color built up here. And then uh, once you get the color wet and activate the pigment, and I can already see um, from this area that's drying that I would need to go back and add more color. But uh, my plan is to just use the Museum Aquarelles as the first uh, layer and then go in with the Pablos and finish it off because the colors work together. And um, if I really want this to uh, be fully 
uh, colored out. You can see this, there's a lot, there's a bit of wax there with the pigment is kind of gone. And that's kind of part of the process of working with these pencils. That in every uh, attempt I've made, um, there are always areas where the, to the tooth just runs out. Um, so, sorry, I guess I, I guess I should have had my light a little closer for most of that video, but when I have it this close, <laughs> Um, it, uh, it's, I can't do any painting. Um, so, um, hopefully that's dry enough to kind of close the page. It kind of took me two one-hour sessions just to do the head, and there's just no way I'm going to do the whole body because I don't, I don't want to waste all of my time and energy and art supplies on an area that's already super blacked out because the point for me is to learn how to color and this, there's no color that's going to show on top of that so um, so I wanted to show you something really cool uh, to wrap up the video and uh, I uh, I took a class with Billy Shaw. I, sh I signed up for a month with her classes and ultimately I just could not understand her British English and she was using a lot of phrases that I just I couldn't understand, and uh, I just I, I found it very difficult to follow her, so I gave up. But I I'll never forget what I learned from her, and uh, I'll talk I'll tell you what I mean. Um, so botan she's a very classically trained uh, botanical watercolor artist, and um, that's what you're going to learn when you uh, when you're in her classes and. We did a calla lily, and I meant to sh uh, bring this here to show it to you, but um, I, I redid that darn thing four times to even try to just come close to what she was able to do. And it does require a lot of flicking motions so that you get very fine, feathery, vein-like strokes of color. And uh, I just found another botanical illustrator that uh, is the best I've ever seen to be quite honest. She's one heck of an amazing gal and she's got a few free videos there. I felt like I learned more from her two videos than I did in all the classes I took from Billy Shoal and Anna Mason. So I'll link to those below because it is so worth looking at. I mean she breaks down to the nitty-gritty how to do a leaf and how to do an open flower. And open flowers are a lot easier to do rather than flowers that have a lot of closed buds. Um, and so I was able to kind of get that effect um, with these pencils and um, I would ultimately want to go back and do a final glaze with a, a very light color uh, in these white areas but since I'm just goofing off you know it was just an experiment and so I'm probably, I'll probably i probably never go back and do that but um, if I were if I were taking it really seriously, I would feel the need to do that. So I I uh, I got really inspired after I did that flower. So I thought, well, maybe I'll try it again on a bigger scale, and then if it works out, I'll share it on a video. So here is a page of a frog with these calla lilies, and the artist kind of. So this is what it looks like uncolored. You have all these strokes. And it's kind of neat because um, it helps you... Uh, I, I do like the concept of learning how to color from grayscale. I just wish it wasn't so heavy-handed and uh, I just wish it were more... Uh, you know, it's a little squiggly and to me traditional grayscale is um, more... Uh, uh, where the lines are kind of shaded but straight. Uh, it's hard to explain, but anybody who's seen grayscale will know what I mean. Oh, you know what? I have a grayscale image here. Um, I There is this uh, watercolor pencil uh, portrait that I uh, want to do next. And um, I'll just show you this is what I mean by real grayscale where it's just very it's it's just imitating 
the stroke line of the pencil marks that you would already make. And I would have preferred that to something like this where, you know, I appreciate the artist was trying to create some texture there, but um, for me, I would rather just start out with something where you, you're you seeing the stroke marks of the pencil. And so if I, I've got all the supplies to follow a tutorial, someone did, uh, it's called, her name is called Coloring with Vicky. And uh, I'm just dying to give this a try. I bought some pencil paper. And so this has sort of been on my desk all week, but I haven't been feeling well, so I've kind of kept putting it off. It's it's all, I, I'm sort of alternate between what I do depending on how well I feel. And um, so I, when I did the baby flowers, I, I just colored them in using that flicking motion. And then I, I activated the water with the flicking motion. So I thought, okay, well, why don't we do it together? I colored in the uh, calla lily and then here I'll just do the flicking motion and uh, I thought people would like this fuchsia color because I think it's really popular and um, probably I can see now that I've overdone it um, and this is where I, I've i put down too much of the same color. I meant this to be a more tonal range. Um, so I'll just flip back to the other color. Here I, this in this flower I used two distinctive colors. And I used the flicking motion and I with the pencil and with the pen. And I was able to get that nice pretty uh, effect that you want in actual water coloring. Um, so with the botanical watercolor artists, they they dissect the flowers and use magnifying glasses and they go into the very details of all the veins and everything in that flower. So it to me I feel like this is a fail and in my case because I was aiming for was what I just showed you and I didn't get that. So um, I used three or four colors on this. So Let's see how this one turns out. I, uh, I'm i just using the same flicking motion that I used with the pencil, the colored pencil, which uh, you would do with a regular pencil. And with this set of colors, there's two fuchsia colors and then there's like two plum tone colors and yeah I'm not liking it um, so I, I can keep going but I just wanted to demonstrate that how I'm doing it here is how I did it on those baby flowers and what I'm learning is that I've just got too much color and I've got um, you know, I've laid down way too much color, um, and I've also blended the the plum tones with the fuchsia, and it looks very flat to me because I didn't uh, choose the appropriate colors, and so it just it just almost looks like mud. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna call that a fail, but. Anyways, I, I did want to show you that um, that flicking motion is how I got the, the baby flowers to work, and I thought that came out really cool. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't recreate that for you in like a live demo. So this one's maybe coming out better, so um, I, I went back, when I started seeing these dark plum tones, I started getting really worried. I said, wow, I should have really tested that out on paper before I committed to this dark drawing. And uh, so I was just kind of, uh, it was like two in the morning and I couldn't sleep and super stressed with everything that's going on. And uh, 
I wasn't in the best frame of mind, but at the very, I did this one last thinking, you know, I better go back to just those two colors. And um, yeah, this is much better. So I like it. And let's see if I can hold that up. So I really apologize if this is really in your face um, or if the colors don't show well. I, uh, I looked at some of my previous videos and I thought, oh my god, people are going to hate me because I have lifted up my coloring too close to the camera and it looks so different for me than it does when I upload. And um, I have put things on fast forward that made me dizzy and I thought, oh my gosh, and I learned the hard way once I modify a video with the software I have, you can't go back and uh, re-edit it. So I really apologize if anybody saw a video that uh, bothered them because I am i don't have a lot of bandwidth uh, to be put energy into a lot of video editing. Uh, but I, I hope to get better over time. The person's videos that I admire the most is Minky Kim. Uh, she has the cutest soundtracks. Uh, uh, and she doesn't talk. <laughs> and I'm not saying that I wouldn't want her to talk. I would love for her to talk. But, um, you know, I think her art speaks for itself. And you never have to worry about goofing up and saying the wrong thing. Um... So many people on YouTube are there to sell product when it comes to art videos. It's, it's very hard to get genuine art instruction. It feels like there's just a lot of influencers out there. And uh, then when you actually sign up for the classes, you still feel like you're being bombarded with a lot of strong messaging to buy this brand of paint and this you know, this product or that product, and so it gets a little overwhelming just trying to learn on your own. Um, why don't I just go for it? And so this frog, I never thought I would do a tree frog, but I thought, well, I'm practicing flowers, we might as well do this little froggy. So this set, um, the full set of the Museum Aquarelles, has a huge range of reddish oranges and uh, now that I've activated it with water I was like oh wow um, that is darn close to what I saw uh, just hold up that light for you guys darn close to what I saw from the photo reference that I was looking at um, these eyes are not drawn properly a real frog, I think these are tree frogs, have a black slit in the middle of their eye. And uh, so, again, I, 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 oh, I, I should wash off my color brush. This, uh, this, one of my enduring frustrations as a wannabe artist is that I, I don't, I feel so confined to working with fabric that someone else designed because if it had been me I would have done it differently or maybe the colors are too saturated or too bright or all these different things I always feel a frustration with and I, I would rather be able to just do my own thing without feeling like I'm just working with someone else's idea of what a frog should look like, you know? Or someone else's idea of what they think makes the perfect whatever, whatever. And it's really hard to escape sort of being trapped and always having to use someone else's design pattern, you know, or you're copying someone else's artwork. I just truly want to just get to the point where I have the skills so I'm kind of off and running on my own rather than sort of stuck with someone else's you know illustration or 
someone else's, you know, style. I, I don't want to be into copying and doing what other people are doing. Um, I think it makes you more nervous in the end uh, because it feels very scary if you put yourself under pressure to imitate and then your imitation is just not very satisfying because you didn't get what the artist had done. And I, I think this is where art has to just be very individual and if you stick to that, I think you'll be happier. At least I know. I think I will be happier. The harder I try to copy and perfect what someone else did, the more frustrated I get and the more I give myself permission to just wing it, I feel more free and happy. Um, when I first start out learning anything new, there's this very strong temptation to want to get all the exact supplies that person used and, you know, use every single last detail of everything. And uh, I kind of went down that rabbit hole for a couple of years and had huge regrets because uh, I ended up just following people who ended up being internet influencers rather than true artists that were genuinely interested in teaching people how to create. And uh, it takes a long time to find those people online. And thankfully, because of the pandemic, a lot more people in the artist community have joined YouTube and they've been able to get sponsors. And one thing I've found is that the artists that have been really successful commercially. Uh, they're the ones that offer you the most instruction because they realize that, you know, people come to them to commission their art because of their reputation. And if, you, if they teach you what they know, it's not a threat to them if you learn from them because they've already established themselves as artists that are in high demand. And so it's absolutely no big deal for them to share, you know, in how-to videos. But artists that haven't really made it, uh, they kind of hold back because all they've got to, to really support themselves with is their teaching and there's a lot of people that will learn from their classes and then just share that learning by charging other people in their own classes. So uh, the whole online art education world, I've learned a lot about that um, throughout the pandemic. I, I've taken, I tried to take a class at a college and I just didn't think that was ever going to, you know, be a viable thing for me because you've got like 30, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an older mom and I'm not, I'm not going to be able to sit in a classroom with a lot of young kids that are more interested in talking to each other all day than uh, sitting down and really learning the the, the lesson. I mean, you've got 30 kids there and really, really hard to just concentrate, listen, and ask questions. It, it just didn't feel like a really good environment. I My son is friends with a family whose daughter went to a really nice elite art school. We have a few of them in the greater Los Angeles area here in California. And I've been on their campuses and they have joint programs with other art programs. Um, in, in Paris, they can do like a semester abroad. And I think those are the kids that are getting access to probably the highest 
quality of art education you can get where they can actually take that into a career. Um, I thought I would just finish out this little leaf. So for the rest of us, you know, that are not in a position to <laughs> drop everything and go to a fancy expensive art school, you know, we just have access to these online classes. And the one I'm the most excited about is Emma Colbert. Um, I absolutely love her animal portraits. And she has got the nicest, sweetest voice. And um, I kind of thought it would be fun to get all the supplies for doing loose pastels and um, kind of get away from pastel pencils and do something that has a more looser style to it that reminds me more of watercolor because it's more ex expressive and I think it's it has a softer kind of expressiveness to it that I, I really like and her teaching style is really fantastic. She's very encouraging and um, she offers um, a lot of foundational information that, about art color theory that a lot of these other online programs don't really show or, or share or relate to. So can you see the difference there? I've all my darkest tones were with the at the base were with those plum tones and then I tried to correct for that by putting the fuchsia tones in the middle and it just I can so this this is a real challenge because I should have done a test and because I didn't do a test it was sort of like a wild card and I took a risk and uh, I'm not liking the way these colors are looking but at least my highlights look like they're in the right area and the the low lights the the, under, the the darkest tones are in the right area but in this aquarelle set you get the two fuchsia and the two plum tones and I'm not liking the way they're working together the way I use them so um, look at my frog first frog <laughs> There, um, there is a gal that did a frog uh, where she had a hot plate underneath her painting and she used, uh, I think, I want to say she used wax-based pencils, they may have been oil-based, and uh, everything just melted as it touched the paper and she was able to get her frog to have that shiny, uh, like, wet, shiny look to it that was phenomenal. So I just used the two lightest tones of green, and that's what I got uh, for my frog. I'm really happy with the yellow reds there. Uh, there's like four of them in the full set. That is fantastic. So anyways, I guess I should stop for now. And in case the other pages didn't have the best lighting in the world, I'll just take you back to those real quick. Uh, this was the sea otter with the neo color two, and uh, so far my favorite is what I did with the mouse. And there's the garden. Uh, a quick mention on the greens. Oh my God, there are brown greens, yellow greens, and blue greens. Maybe two of each. So. This set is going to offer you a wonderful uh, range of green tones that were super cool for landscape people. And then um, I'll just take you to my embarrassing iceberg. And this is the Neo Color Blue Tones. So this was. Uh, kind of a summary of how I've been getting through these really hot days dealing with pandemic fatigue and uh, just sharing a little bit of what I've learned from these products and uh, just offer this off to YouTube and see if this inspires or helps somebody and uh, I've ordered some yarn to rework the hat I shared in my last video and if it gets if we have a cold snap 
uh, before the winter ends, then I will definitely knit that hat again with the uh, cardigan palette colors from Marie Wallen for her chestnut cardigan. And I'll share that with everybody and, and show you if it made a difference with the new colors. So anyways, uh, thanks for watching you guys. Um, kind of get a review of these products here and how I'm learning to use them and what I think of this this book. So have a wonderful rest of your weekend if you get this today or tomorrow. Otherwise, have a great week. Hang in there. Think things are going to get better in March and we'll all be able to enjoy a little bit more activity uh, outside again. So thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys on the next video. Have a great, great rest of your day.